In chapter one, we're going to attempt to answer the very broad question, what is psychology? To do this, we'll talk briefly about the roots of psychology as a field, and we'll talk a little bit about what the field looks like today. Along the way, we're going to discuss some relevant concepts related to science and research in general, and we're going to use these to lay the groundwork to discuss the variety of other topics that we're going to be covering this semester. So let's start off at the very beginning with what people already think about psychology. Before you come into a psychology class, what is it that you envision psychology to be? Now, most people will often associate psychology with specifically studying and treating psychological disorders. So maybe you envision a very Freudian therapist sitting in a dark room in a big red armchair, and they have a client on uh, reclined on a couch in front of them, recalling their deepest, darkest secret. Now, I'm not saying that can't be part of psychology, but as hopefully you'll start finding as we move throughout this chapter, and especially throughout this course, psychology is so much more than that. Some psychology researchers work with lab rats who run mazes or push buttons in awkward conditioning chambers. Um, there are psychologists who study child development, where we look at how we develop as we grow. We might look into research on the causes of different kinds of psychological disorders, as opposed to treatment of them. Or maybe we'll look at biases or how the brain is functioning while we're doing tasks. All of these varied and very different um, uh, practices and approaches all fall under what is the very broad umbrella of psychology. And as we get through some of the history of psychology as a field, we're going to find that the field itself, the official name of psychology, is a fairly recent occurrence, only in the past uh, couple hundred years. But the history of psychology-like ideas has persevered for centuries. So when we start talking about the history of psychology, we don't start at the founding of the first psychology lab. We're going to go back to some of the core ideas that help build into psychology as it is today. And so, of course, let's start at the beginning with, if we're going to talk about psychology, what is psychology? What's our definition for it? From the linguistic side of things, the word psychology is actually derived from two Greek terms, psyche, meaning soul, and logos, meaning to study. So at its root, we're saying that psychology is the act of studying the soul. Now, that isn't the definition that we still use today. And we'll actually see that there are quite a few different definitions of psychology that are used even now. Um, so we're going to pick the one that suits us best. And my preferred definition of psychology is the scientific study of behavior and the mind. So by specifying that it's scientific study, we're saying that knowledge is being gained through empirical observation. So we are um, collecting information in a predictable way. We are um, setting it up in a scientific manner. And I'll actually talk a little bit about the scientific approach and why that's separate from just general observation on our next slide. When we talk about behavior, our definition of behavior is going to be any kind of observable action. So this can include words, gestures, responses, any kind of biological activity. And for the mind, the mind is the contents of our conscious experience. So these would be our sensations, perceptions, thoughts, and emotions, all the stuff that's going on internally. Now, I have also seen many other definitions of psychology, one of which being the scientific study of conscious experience. But I don't necessarily love that definition because it focuses on the conscious, and as we'll find as we move through this topic, there is quite a bit to do with the unconscious that may or may not be relevant. So I don't want to exclude it using a definition like that. So we stick with ours, the basic, the scientific study of behavior and the mind. Now, when we talk about studying something scientifically, we're generally talking about the scientific approach or the scientific method. There's a bunch of different names for it, but it's all the same basic procedure. 
And for us, the scientific approach would be defined as the systemic gathering and evaluation of empirical evidence. So if we break that down into what that all means, if it's systemic, we're meaning that it's performed according to a particular set of rules or conditions. So before we start gathering and evaluating our evidence, we're going to outline some rules as to how we gather that evidence. So I've mentioned I like studying songbirds, so maybe I wanted to look at chickadees and how many chickadees are on campus. So maybe I go outside and I take pictures of chickadees. That should tell me how many birds are on campus. Except that's not a systemic way of doing it. We'd have to have some rules and some guidelines outlined before we could call that a scientific approach. So maybe I say that I want to walk from one corner of campus to the other every day for a month. I'm going to follow the same. I'm going to go at the same time of day and I'll take pictures of every single chickadee that I pass on that line from one corner to the other. I could then say that that's a systemic approach because if somebody else wanted to follow my guidelines, they could do the same thing and they should theoretically see a similar number of birds. So we've outlined exactly how I'm going to do that so that if somebody wanted to replicate or repeat a study that I had conducted, they could do so. So our second example there is a systemic approach. And when we talk about empirical evidence, we're really caring about um, a situation where something is capable of being verified or disproven by observation or experiment. Now, this is a weird way to think about, it, but when we're looking at scientific statements, there are almost always going to be things that we can gather evidence that either supports or refutes whatever idea it is that we're looking at. So if I'm trying to figure out if there are chickadees on campus, I can gather evidence of there being chickadees by taking pictures of them. There are some non-empirical statements that are really not scientific and unverifiable. Uh, so you could say things like, Cadbury is the best chocolate. Well, you haven't really given any criteria to judge that by, and it's an opinion. So that wouldn't be an empirical statement. So when we're using the scientific approach, we're focusing on trying to frame things in a way where we can have a systemic outline of how we're going to proceed, as well as having the situation be empirical, where it's something that we can find support for or find evidence against. Um, so there should be some kind of stimuli, some kind of observation that we can make that could help us support or refute a claim that we're looking at. And so that's our basic breakdown of the scientific approach. And we're going to talk way more about this in chapter two, but that should get us started. While we're on the topic of science and doing science, let's take a minute to talk about different types of scientific research. And so mainly you can see types of research divided, divided into two broad categories. We're going to look at basic research and applied research. After I introduce these two types, I'm actually going to talk about a third type of research that bridges the gap between those two. So instead of just these two divisions, we're technically going to be looking at three, but you'll see why I explain it this way in just a minute. So when we talk about basic research, we're talking about research that's being conducted to find knowledge just for the sake of finding knowledge. So I want to learn more about chickadees because I find them interesting. Or I want to learn more about because I don't know how they work. In contrast, applied research is research that's trying to answer a specific question or solve a specific problem. So I need to learn more about chickadee vocalizations because I need to find a way to keep them out of areas that are dangerous. So I'm trying to solve a specific problem using research. So if you have that specific problem you're trying to solve or a specific question that you're trying to direct uh, an answer towards, that's going to be applied research. Whereas if you're just um, studying something to understand how it works in general, that's going to be basic research. Now, for some examples, I can show you 
Here we have an interesting example of basic research. So the Queenland, Queenland Brain Institute studies cephalopods, and that's the family that includes squids and octopuses, cuttlefish, and nautilus. Um, and so they want to study them to understand how they see the world and how they communicate. They don't know much about their perception. They don't know much about their communication. So they're doing basic research just to figure out how these organisms exist and how they work in their environment. Um, and I've included some links here just because this is a really cool website, um, not because it's something you have to see, but because I think it's interesting. On the same uh, sort of vein, looking at those cephalopods, we can look at the octopus project. And this is an example of applied research where these researchers are trying to build a robot that could be used in underwater search and rescue and exploration, but they're specifically studying how octopus arms and tentacles work in order to sort of copy that as a robot. As you can see in the image here, they have this flexible tentacle looking arm that's part of their robot. And they're trying to use that model because robots are very dexterous. They have a lot of, a lot of range of motion and it seems to work really well underwater. So here, these researchers are studying octopuses in order to solve a particular problem, which is finding a good way to have um, prehensile arms on robots for exploration purposes. So if I was asking an exam question and I described a particular kind of research, you might want to be able to determine if that research is something that's basic, if there is no particular problem they're trying to solve or question they're trying to answer, or if it's applied, if we specify what they want to do with the knowledge that they gain from their research. And I did mention that there is a third sort of in-between type of research, and this is called translational research. And aptly for the name, translation research involves taking things that you learned from doing basic research and applying it to a specific problem. So sometimes when you're conducting basic research, when you're trying to learn about something for the sake of learning about something, the outcome that you get, the things that you learn, turns out to be very useful. So you might discover that, uh, a particular sound that the birds make is really good for a particular purpose. If you then take what you learn from that basic research and apply it to a problem that you've encountered, then you're conducting translational research. So you're taking some of that basic research and using it in a practical application after the fact. So that's why I introduced translational research as that in-between state between our basic and applied research. And for those of you who are visual learners, we can take a look at this little chart here that just shows the fact that information and research findings move pretty dramatically between different areas of psychology. So we have the basic research, and basic research can be directly applied in the form of that translational research I just mentioned, where if any basic information comes out and would help solve some problems, we can also have basic research that then leads us to conduct applied research. Or maybe applied research raises questions that we don't know how to answer and we go back and do basic research. So all of these arrows are bi-directional because there's a lot of back and forth here. And you note that clinical research and practice is included as its own little separate entry over there. And that's because a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about in this class deal with psychology in general. So as you've already figured out, probably, we don't just look at humans. We don't just look at psychological disorders. We're kind of looking at a little bit of everything. And so clinical research and practice falls under its own umbrella because it does specifically work with humans, not exclusively, but the majority of it is work with humans. And um, it sort of has its own rules and regulations and guidelines there. So you'll find, uh, especially if you continue onward in psychology, you can take clinical psychology classes and you'll find that they have a very different focus than broad general psychology does. And that's why we keep that over 
its own separate little box. 